Good Friday, everybody. We hope you're well. And thank you again for checking in with this broadcast, which we've been doing uh, each day this week, uh, what we're calling the most important week in the history of the world. Um, the term Good Friday is an interesting one. I just used it as sort of a greeting. Uh, of course, you're hearing that term a lot in the news and, and perhaps otherwise, uh, sort of in a religious sense, calling uh, this particular Friday of Holy Week Good Friday. Um, to me, it's a bit of a misnomer. Now, I'm not just trying to be contrary in that, but um, as, as I study the events of Friday of this most important week, I don't see much good in the way we normally use the word good. Now, Good Friday, that, that term is sort of using the old meaning of the word good, which was uh, sort of a synonym of holy. And so Holy Friday, I can understand that more as being true. The events, in a sense, are, are holy. They lead to holiness. But good, as opposed to bad, uh, in the way we normally think of the, the word good, to me it doesn't seem fitting, at least uh, the way we use the word, and so it could lead to misunderstanding. It's not a big deal. I don't think people are bad people or have made a horrendous mistake if they use the term. I just wanted to point out uh, that issue. Uh, but we're talking about this, this uh, great, important day. Uh, of, of this week, and uh, in the way we reckon time, of course, it began at midnight uh, the previous night. Now, yesterday we studied a Thursday. Thursday was a day of preparation, uh, where they got ready to celebrate the Passover, and uh, Jesus and the disciples had a meal together, a Passover meal, uh, during which Jesus transformed the elements um, from Passover meal to what we call the Lord's Supper, the bread to remember his body and the cup to remember his blood, which he would give today, Friday, uh, in sacrifice for us. And then they left the city and went out to Gethsemane, uh, across the, the brook Kidron, up the hill, of the Mount of Olives to the garden that that they often frequented and apparently uh, used as a place of devotion and prayer. Jesus went in and prayed with a greatly burdened heart and uh, we, we made quick reference to that, just not having time to go into great depth with it. Um, don't know exactly when midnight came but we're assuming sometime while they're in the garden um, that we go from Thursday to Friday again in the way we think of time, in the way we reckon our days. But sometime at the close of that prayer session in Gethsemane, uh, the betrayer arrives, Judas, with a detachment of soldiers from the temple guard and um, the, the religious leaders and so forth. And um, it may have been several hundred soldiers that, that came out to arrest Jesus, which was certainly overkill. Jesus is there with, with three disciples, maybe uh, um, eight others close by, but certainly hundreds of soldiers weren't needed. Uh, but it will show um, Jesus' incredible power in the way it's described here. And I thought we'd begin with a little reading from the 18th chapter of John, just to sort of set the stage. Uh, beginning of chapter 18 of John says, When Jesus had spoken these words, that is, the, remember chapters 13 through 17 of John, Jesus teaching and encouraging the disciples in the upper room. Uh, but after that, chapter 18, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered, 
Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. You can see there sort of the overkill and the approach. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Now remember, in the other gospel accounts of this, he actually kisses Jesus as a way of pointing out who he is to the soldiers and so forth, betrays him with a kiss. Uh, John doesn't mention that here in this reading. But continuing in verse 6, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. Referring uh, to the, the disciples that were with him. It's always been a, a bit of an a overlooked and neglected part of the, the arrest scene that, that John relates there when Jesus speaks this word, I am, and that's actually what he says, I am. Um, the translators supply for us the word he. Uh, as, as we read there in the English Standard Version, when they ask, uh, uh, when they say we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, um, the ESV says, Jesus said, I am he. Uh, Literally, he said, I am. And you know how important a term, a phrase that was. Jesus often said, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And when you link that with the Old Testament usage of I am, he's really making a claim to be God when he uses those words. And on this occasion, when he does so, all these hundreds of, of people who have come out to arrest him and to take him by force, fall to the ground. Uh, incredible show of power. It doesn't seem that they're harmed, but it sort of knocks them back. And that's just an amazing detail to me. Well, of course, then they take him into custody. And uh, the rest of the night is spent in a series of hearings, I almost don't want to use the word trials because it's certainly not trials like anything we expect in the justice system. Um, Jesus goes through six trials, let's call them that for lack of a better term, um, but they're certainly not about justice. But six different hearings, he'll have three before Jewish authorities, and three before Roman authorities. And so before the Jews, the three before the Jews, he'll, he'll go before this high priest named Annas, and then another named Caiaphas, and then he'll be before the group called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were sort of the Jewish Supreme Court. Um, Jesus has just been betrayed by Judas, as we know, one of twelve one thing that we might think about is that by the end of the story, we will see two of the Sanhedrin betray the Sanhedrin. That is, show that they are loyal to Jesus rather than to the Jewish Supreme Court, of which they were members. Uh, but he'll go before, again, Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. And then the Roman trials, the civil trials, were before Pilate, the governor of the region, and then before a man named Herod, and then he goes back before Pilate a second time. Again, to say trial, uh, probably like using the word good applied to Friday, probably leads to misunderstanding. There's no due process whatsoever in these hearings. There's zero justice. It's one of the reasons I just have a hard time calling this day good. Uh, when he goes before the Jewish officials, he's assumed to be guilty, and uh, 
Nothing's going to get in the way of that verdict, not even the truth. And so uh, there's no justice. And then when he goes before the Romans, Jesus is never convicted of anything. It's not as if uh, a jury brings back to a verdict of guilty. Uh, what happens at the end is Pilate just hands Jesus over to the Jews in order to avoid more grief, more controversy. His job was to keep the peace in the region, and uh, he does whatever he can to make that happen. So he hands Jesus over. One great scholar of the, uh, these events made a list of some of the major miscarriages of justice that took place in these six hearings, these trials. Uh, I don't have the whole list before me, but, but several points. I'll just read through them for you to think about. Uh, all these were violations of either Jewish law, Roman law, or just uh, goodwill and common sense. So uh, Jesus, first of all, was arrested through a bribe. He was arrested also without a clear charge being made. Uh, among the Jews, trials were not supposed to be held at night or during a feast. And, and we know this is the feast of the Passover. And yet uh, they're holding this trial. And it was also very strange for them to, to uh, have a crucifixion during Passover. It caused all kinds of problems for people. Uh, but it shows you how bent they were on destroying Jesus of Nazareth. Also, uh, during the process, they used torture, physical coercion, to try and intimidate Jesus and get him to say something they wanted him to say. Uh, they brought false witnesses. Um, these false witnesses not only lie, but Amongst themselves, they, they offer contradictory testimony, and false testimony. Um, Jesus is never allowed to defend himself. You know, he, he doesn't have a lawyer. He doesn't uh, get to cross-examine witnesses. The, the high priest, and there are two men in this process referred to as high priest. We could discuss why uh, that's the case, but... I'll let you study that out another time. Annas and Caiaphas are both referred to as high priests. Um, but the high priest was supposed to, at the end of trials, call for a vote of the Sanhedrin, uh, sort of like a jury verdict of the Supreme Court. He never does that. At his Jewish trial, Jesus was, was charged with blasphemy. He was charged with... Um, violations of the temple law, but the charges when he goes before the Romans are changed. And the Romans didn't really care about those things that the Jews charged him with, and so they switch the charges when they go before the Romans, and um, there they say he claims to be king, and he's causing disturbances, and he refuses to pay taxes, those things that the, that the Romans cared about see how unjust that is that the that the accusations change depending on the audience and another thing that was just a plain miscarriage of justice was the fact that he was convicted and executed the very same day as the trial so the trials are happening in the middle of the night uh, overnight on Friday and then of course we know he is crucified on Friday um, between 9 and 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, so uh, there was nothing just or right or good about these these trials. Um, he goes before Annas, as we said. He's then taken before Caiaphas, um, and all kinds of misrepresentations are made. Uh, Mark tells about this part of the trial, chapter 14. Matthew tells about it in chapter 26. Um, and uh, while all this sham is going on, there's, there's stuff going on outside of the courtroom. 
if you want to call it that. Um, and, and to me, this probably multiplies Jesus' suffering even more than what's going on before the authorities because while, while he's being lied about and mistreated in front of the authorities, Peter, uh, one of his closest followers, is out in the courtyard and three different times is denying that he even knows Jesus. It, uh, that occurs out in the courtyard of the high priest's palace. Uh, Jesus knew this was going to happen. He told Peter it was going to happen that very night earlier. And in fact, we're, we're told as we read the text that um, when it happens, Jesus looks directly at Peter and their eyes meet and Peter realizes what he's done and he runs away. Um, we don't hear about Peter again for quite some time. Uh, the third phase again is before the Sanhedrin. Uh, Luke chapter 22 gives us a little bit about this phase of the trial. It's, Luke tells us it's daybreak now and he's taken before the entire council. There would have been about 70 people in the Jewish Supreme Court. They met up in the temple. They had their chambers up there. Um, they were allowed to pass a death sentence on a person, but they were not allowed to execute the sentence without the Romans approving it. So that tells you why he's going to go then before Roman authorities. And, uh, you know, the Jews had... Jewish leaders had made their decision. They just need to get Roman approval. And this is about the time, um, again, talking about things that are going on outside of the chambers, about the time that Judas has, has uh, concluded that um, he's done great evil and, and he tries to return the money that he betrayed Jesus for. Uh, but it's too late, and, and we know how that works out. In the end, Judas takes his own life. So the scene shifts um, to one of the great buildings in Jerusalem, no doubt the palace of the Roman governor, Pilate. He is the most powerful government official in Palestine, has absolute power of life and death over people. In fact, we know from secular history that he often used it and he killed a lot of Jews. Pilate was no friend of, of these men who were accusing Jesus, although they try to flatter him and, and act like they're his friend. Uh, but Pilate is under a tremendous amount of pressure from Rome to keep control of things in troublesome Judea and Palestine. And, you know, if he failed in his job, his life was over. So the Sanhedrin uses that as leverage to control Pilate. And they're sort of playing off one another uh, in this whole process. Uh, they want Pilate, as you read the text, John chapter 18, for instance, they want Pilate to just accept their verdict, uh, but he will not. Um, he, he is trying to string this thing out. Um, you know, if the Jews themselves had executed Jesus, it wouldn't have been by crucifixion. Their, their mode of executing people was by stoning, as we read in other cases. For instance, Stephen in the book of Acts, uh, they stoned people to death. But uh, Roman, the Roman mode of execution, of capital punishment at the time, was crucifixion. And... Um, so that's why that ends up being uh, what happens to the Lord because uh, they get the, the Roman authorities involved. There are some really interesting uh, interchanges between Jesus and Pilate as he goes before Pilate, some conversations where it almost seems like the Lord is trying to, to reach out to Pilate. Uh, and I encourage you to read through those passages and reflect on them as part of this Friday as well. Uh, after this first time before Pilate, Jesus is shipped off to Herod. Uh, this is told about in Luke chapter 23, verses 6 through 12. He's taken before Herod, and we classify Herod 
as a civil authority or sort of a Roman authority, even though he's called the king of the Jews. Uh, he's sort of a very worldly king, more Roman than Jew, especially in the opinion of the Jews. And this is, this is Herod, Herod Antipas. Uh, Herod is in town for the feast, uh, like Pilate is. Normally Herod lived up in Galilee, where Jesus came from. And, uh, you know, Pilate probably passes him off, passes Jesus off to Herod in hopes that, that, that Herod will make the decision that he doesn't want to have to make. Uh, you might remember uh, this Herod is the very same one who arrested and executed Jesus' cousin, John, the baptizer. And um, it's very interesting when, when Jesus goes before Herod, he is completely silent. Uh, to me, that speaks volumes about what he thought of Herod. He, uh, Herod is the only person in the Gospels that Jesus 100% refuses to talk to face to face. Uh, although Herod is coaxing him and trying to get him to, um, he will not speak before Herod. And even though he will speak before Pilate and actually converse with Pilate, a Roman, a Gentile, a pagan, uh, but before the king of the Jews, so-called so Jesus remains completely silent. That tells you something um, about his thoughts on the matter. So uh, after, we don't know how long, uh, but after a period of time, Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate. And you can imagine that Pilate is not happy to, to see this problem coming back his way. So we come to the, the sixth and final phase of the trial process back before Pilate. And what we'll do here is, just, I guess what we've sort of been doing is summarize, because we get a lot of verses devoted to this in all four Gospels, uh, in Matthew 27, in Mark 15, in Luke 23, and in John 18 and 19. We have this last phase before Pilate narrated. Pilate, again, not happy to see Jesus coming back without a verdict. He offers to punish Jesus, probably meaning to uh, severely beat him, whip him, flog him, and then release him, hoping that this would be sufficient. And uh, at this point, the, uh, uh, there's this custom mentioned in the Gospels that every year at the feast, um, a Jewish prisoner, somebody being held prisoner by the Romans, would be released by the governor. And uh, the one that, that is in question this time is Barabbas. Um, it's interesting, you study Barabbas, he had done exactly what they accused Jesus of. He was a rebel. And so Pilate parades out Barabbas, parades out Jesus, asks the crowd whether he should release Jesus or Barabbas, most likely thinking that surely they're going to choose Jesus, not this murderer Barabbas. But uh, we know that the authorities were stirring up the crowd uh, to, to ask for the release of Barabbas instead. Likely, Barabbas was scheduled to be crucified, um, along with the two others that were crucified with Jesus. But when, when uh, they choose Barabbas to be released, and then Pilate asks the crowd, what do you want me to do with Jesus? This is where we get the shouts of crucify him. So uh, Pilate still feeling he's dealing with a basically innocent man um, and wanting to find a way to release him decides to have Jesus severely flogged. Um, but he, after doing so, he finds out that this extreme measure doesn't satisfy the crowds. They want more blood. Uh, they want the cross. Um, usually this 
flogging, this, this particular kind of beating, was severe enough to kill people. Many people that were subjected to it uh, died from it. Jesus, of course, survives it. And then he has enough strength to be dragged back out before the people by Pilate. And Pilate makes one more appeal for his life. But, of course, they insist on crucifixion. And then the sad scene where Pilate takes him back inside one more time for one final question. As I said, you, you want to go back and read the, the initial audience that, that Pilate had with Jesus in their initial conversation. It was uh, pretty intense and involved, but this time after being whipped and, uh, and, and severely mistreated, Jesus refuses to speak. And Pilate seems put off by this and says, You know, don't you, that I have the power to release you. Pilate says this to Jesus. And then finally Jesus says, You wouldn't have any power if God had not given it to you. It's amazing throughout this, the many different times we see who's really in control. He speaks one word and 600 soldiers are knocked to the ground. And he tells the most powerful man in the region, you have no power over me. Both times he's completely right. Well, throughout this pilot has made several attempts to get out of this mess to no avail. And I'm sure you remember how he at the end of the trial, washes his hands symbolically before the people and uh, hands Jesus over to the authorities to be crucified. Well, by this time, of course, it's, it's, it's well into daylight hours. Um, Jesus is led from the palace of Pilate to the actual site of the crucifixion, um, which would have been outside of the city walls. They would have never crucified anybody within the city walls of Jerusalem. Of course, if you visit Jerusalem today, uh, the site of the crucifixion is within the current city walls, but not in the first century. So uh, he's led out of the city through the streets of the city. He's carrying the cross beam of the cross, uh, the beam would have been extremely heavy, maybe as much as 100 pounds. I was trying to think of a parallel. And, um, you go to one of our, our uh, hardware stores or, or maybe here locally in Menards and go out into the lumber yard and look at those railroad ties that you can get for landscaping. And I cut one of those in half and then try and lift just half of it. I mean, try and lift one of them. Uh, full is just impossible by yourself, but cut one in half, and that's probably about what we're talking about here, the cross beam of the cross. And we understand here's a man who was whipped almost to death. He falls at least once under the weight of the cross beam, and that's where we meet this man named Simon, who is called out from the crowd to, to carry the cross the rest of the way to the side of the crucifixion. We know as Jesus goes, he interacts with some of the people, some of the women of Jerusalem. Um, he manages to speak. He prophesies uh, the, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem some 35, 40 years in the future. It's amazing what he's able to, to, to call up the strength to do despite all the torture he's gone through. They finally bring him to this, the site of execution, this place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Uh, Golgotha is the Hebrew term, the Jewish term. Uh, the Latin term is Calvary. And so depending on who was describing it, they might use one or the other term. Crucifixion begins at 9 a.m. Uh, it lasts until 3 and when it comes to the actual 
crucifixion itself, there's almost no description. I mean, if all we had was the four gospel writers and had no other information, no history, nothing, we wouldn't know what crucifixion was. Because when you read the gospels and they come to the site of the crucifixion, basically all they say is, and there they crucified him often wondered why is that why not more detail um, is it because everybody in the first century knew what it was all about didn't need to describe it possibly is it uh, that it's just too horrible to put into words possibly I, I don't know exactly but as far as the physical you know what the nails and and the lifting up of the cross and dropping it and so forth into the hole. We don't have that. We just have the words, and they crucified him. And, and so um, Jesus, when he is finally put on the cross, he, of course we know he speaks several times from the cross. That's an interesting study, to study the words that he spoke. They're all, every one of them, important. There is a sentence affixed above his head. Um, the sentence is really more a statement of truth, truth than a list of his crimes. And all through the process of, of the time of the crucifixion, people are hurling insults, spitting. Um, Jesus is pretty much abandoned. You know, all the male disciples... Uh, leave him except for John. Uh, the women stay. The men run away. And the women stay. Mark tells us in Mark chapter 15 that there is darkness that comes upon the world between noon and 3 p.m. Um, so, you know, he's on the cross for three hours. And then darkness comes at noon, and it is dark for the next three hours. Jesus dies after only six hours on the cross. Most everybody that was crucified lasted much longer than that. Many people uh, hung on crosses for days, but um, not on this day. Jesus just survives the cross for six hours, uh, the, you know, the two others who were crucified with him would have lived much longer than they did, but, but uh, you remember that the soldiers break their legs, which hastens their death, and uh, they don't do that to Jesus. And Jesus, there, there is this sense that's developed all through the story that Jesus willingly goes to the cross and he gives up his life. It's not taken from him, but he gives it. And in fact, when he described the cross earlier, um, that's the way he described it. And so the very way he described it, no one takes my life from me, but I give it, is exactly the way it plays out. And so, um, such important events, I just feel like the few words I've spoken about them are, aren't enough. Um, just a couple other things. We have these incredible responses to the death of Jesus. I just want to share one last reading with you from, from Matthew's account in chapter 27, um, which sort of summarizes a few of these responses. Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 51. At the moment of Jesus' death, behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. 
And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. This earthquake that strikes when Jesus dies uh, has multiple effects. It destroys part of the temple, at least part of the temple, the, the great curtain that separated the, the most holy place from the rest of the temple. Um, 60 feet wide, we're told by, by Josephus, the, the Jewish historian at the time. 60 foot wide curtain, 30 feet high, thick as the palm of your hand, and it's torn by God, who else could have done it, from top to bottom. And that's really a signal of not only the future destruction of the temple, but more importantly, this new access to God and the presence of God that's opened up by the events of this day. I guess that's a reason that we might call it good. The earthquake also breaks open the tombs of the city, the great cemetery that faced Jerusalem, still there today, and uh, the earthquake breaks the tombs open. And we're told by Matthew that on Resurrection Day, on Sunday, that the dead in them are raised up and they go into the city. Oh, I'd love to have a, a, a long book just telling about that, wouldn't you? And what happened in the city of Jerusalem on that day. And then the, the centurion who's in charge of the scene uh, who sees everything that's going on and, and, and directed it, uh, he, he is moved by what he witnesses. Uh, we wonder, did he become a believer um, after these events? It's interesting the way Scripture te treats centurions. Roman soldiers, every time a centurion is mentioned, something positive is said about him in the New Testament. So, from this point, uh, because it's nearing the end of the day, I remember that they, the Jews, reckon their days as ending at 6 p.m. So we're sometime between 3 and 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Sabbath starts. And not just Sabbath, but it's Sabbath of Passover week. It's a high Sabbath. There is a great rush to do something about these dead bodies. Get these bodies down from the crosses. Get them buried before Sabbath. Uh, Jesus, of course, when, they, when the soldiers inspect the bodies, Jesus is already dead. Uh, the others, as we, as we mentioned, have their legs broken to hasten their death. Uh, they pierce Jesus' side with a, with a spear to make sure that he's dead. And then, you know, we started this account with the betrayal of Judas. But I'd like to also think about the fact that in the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court that had a big part in condemning Jesus, there were two who betrayed the Sanhedrin. One of them's name was Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. And we're told um, that that he was a secret follower of Jesus. And uh, this day changes that because he openly comes now to Pilate and he asked for the privilege of caring for, caring for the body of Jesus, preparing it for burial. And so Joseph is out of the closet as a believer now of Jesus. And then along with Joseph comes Nicodemus, You've heard of him before. He's also a believer. He's also a member of the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. And he brings spices to 
um, to uh, prepare Jesus' body for burial. And, and together they will work on that. They will prepare the body of Jesus. They will lay it in a new tomb that's donated by Joseph of Arimathea. It's a place very near the site of Golgotha. And, uh, and it says that the tomb, after Jesus is placed in it, is closed up with a large stone at the entrance. And later, um, the Jews, the Jewish authorities, will request that a military guard be placed at the tomb throughout the weekend to make sure that, that uh, nobody comes, the disciples don't come, and steal the body. So that gets us through um, Friday of the most important week in the history of the world. In closing, uh, what we'll find about Saturday is that Scripture is silent. And so we're going to stay silent. We won't broadcast tomorrow. Uh, but Jesus is, is in the tomb on Saturday. Um, next time we'll see one another in this medium is this Sunday, uh, where great things happen. God bless you. We'll, we'll see you again soon.